Python, 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 Python. Everyone has been telling you to learn Python. Now, a big question I'm sure you have is why? You know, just like, how was the universe created? Why do I have no money? All important questions. Well, to answer that, Python is extremely beginner friendly for a whole range of reasons. One of my personal favorites is that it doesn't scream at you when you make a mistake, like some other languages do. And the other thing I like about Python is that it's a lot easier to read compared to some other languages. Here's an example. This is a line in Python. So we've got print hello world. Now just looking at that, you'll think, okay, print does something and we've got in speech marks, hello world. So it probably prints hello world. That, that, that seems pretty straightforward. Now this is the same line in C++. And as you can see, it's pretty complicated. So Python definitely wins in terms of simplicity. But rather than stressing about which language you should learn, it's really all about getting started with any language. And that makes it a lot easier to learn other languages when you need to. So today I'll be bringing you through the basics of Python. So if you haven't already, we need to install Python. And to do this, we need to visit the Python website and we can go straight to the downloads and we can just click this download button. So download Python 3.12. Okay, now it's downloaded. So we can open it up and just run through the installation. See, this is how they get you. They put so many different terms and conditions. Yeah, I'm not gonna read it. So we're gonna click install. You might need to type in your administrator password. And there we go, now it's installed. So you'll notice here we have two pretty important things. So we've got the IDLE and we have the Python launcher. Now the Python launcher is what runs our Python code. It tells the computer how to read it and run it. And we also have the IDLE, which is basically a very simple text editor, which will let you write Python code. Now the IDLE is basically the equivalent of using some kind of notepad versus is using Google Docs. Now in Google Docs, it'll tell you, hey, this is misspelled, or maybe you could write this. And we have something similar for programming. We have IDEs. And what IDE stands for is Integrated Development Environment. I definitely did not need to search that up. So like Google Docs, which helps you write essays and whatnot, an IDE helps you write code. So it'll tell you if it thinks there's a mistake in your code, or it'll help you catch errors before you actually run the code. And that's really helpful. Now, sometimes we have different IDEs for different languages. For example, you'll hear a lot about VS Code and people like VS Code because it basically supports any language. Now for Python, my personal favorite is PyCharm. And you'll hear a lot in my videos, I'll say, I hate VS Code and I'm a non-believer in the VS Code cult. But in all honesty, an IDE is just an IDE and it all comes down to personal preference. So I'm gonna go ahead and download PyCharm. Now, make sure you get Community Edition, otherwise it'll be pretty expensive. So I'm gonna click on this and then I need to scroll down quite a lot and there it is. And they're quite sneaky because it's actually below. So once you click download and it's downloaded, you can open it and then drag it into your applications. Then if you're on Mac, you can open the launch pad and then open PyCharm. So here we have PyCharm. And the first thing you usually do is open a new project. I'm gonna call this Beginners Python. Now this is one of the reasons I like PyCharm a lot because it does a lot for you. So here it says it's gonna create a virtual environment for you. And what a virtual environment is, it's, it's kind of like having a bubble on your computer. So anything you code in this bubble doesn't affect anything outside of the bubble. Now you might not really understand what we need this bubble for but i think one of the biggest use cases is for example if we wanted to install a module so let's say we had a module that was going to help us create a website now if we install the module inside this bubble it isn't installed everywhere on the computer now if you didn't have a virtual environment it would install it on your computer and this could affect things on your computer you just never know and that's why it's better to use a virtual environment so now i'm going to click create and here we have our first project right a little tip any programmer that uses a light theme is officially not a programmer we do not claim them you have to use dark theme it's just a rule i didn't write the rules so as i was saying here we have our virtual environment so any modules that we want to install is created in here and now we can go ahead and create our first python script so i'm going to right click i'm going to create new and i'm going to click python file and you can call this first function and the first function people normally learn in programming and it is something you saw earlier in the video is print hello world. Yes, don't misspell hello. And you can either run it from PyCharm or you can run it from the terminal. So 
So you type Python first function the pi. And there you go. It does the same thing. So what we have here is print, which is essentially output to terminal. Now what the terminal is, is it's a way to communicate or uh, use your computer through text. So if you didn't have your Mac OS Windows, then you'd be using the terminal. And so print, what print does is it outputs to the terminal. So it outputs a message, hello world. And hello world is kind of a rite of passage. So every new programmer has to write hello world. But you can basically print anything here. So I can print max codes and that would output to the terminal. Okay, not if you miss speech marks. Uh, this is why I'm saying Python is really nice to you because if you did this in another language, you might get hundreds and hundreds of lines of errors, not with Python. Now, outputting to the terminal is really important in programming because it's a way to communicate results or messages. So if anything goes wrong in your script, it'll be in the terminal. So I would also be printing things like testing, it reached this part of the script. And things like this will probably be really important when you're learning to code and you don't know how to use the proper error messages yet. Well, congratulations, you've written your first function in Python. Okay, so now that we've created our first function in Python, let's talk about data types. So in programming, we work with different data types and each of them serve a different purpose. Now, one that we've already seen is strings. So in our print hello world, in between the speech marks is a string. So if you're going to make an assumption that anything in these speech marks would be a string, you'd be correct. So a string is any text in Python, and you can even treat numbers as a string as long as you put them in speech marks. So for example, if I change this and I put six instead, six is now a string. And you can declare them by, firstly, you put the name of a variable. So I'm going to put my name. And then to declare a string, I'm going to put speech marks and then I'm going to put max because my name is max. So other than setting our variables manually in the code, we could also take an input from the terminal. So if I wanted the user's name, I could put name equals input. And then I could put what's your name. So if I hit run, it's going to ask you for your name. So a thing to keep in mind about inputs is it only takes in strings. And the thing that goes in the brackets is a prompt. So now that we've got text covered, you're probably wondering, how do we deal with numbers? Well, there are two different data types for numbers. Firstly, we have integers, which is any whole number. So that could be zero to 100, or that could be negative 100. And you can create one like a string. So I could put number, and then I could put equals, and then I could put 20. And now you've declared an integer. And the other data type is floats. And a float is any number which has a decimal. So I can declare floats similarly, but instead I'm gonna have a decimal. So I could put 20.5. So now you're probably wondering, similarly to strings, how do we take an input? Well, it's actually quite similar. So instead, I'm going to take this and now I'm going to put age. I'm going to put what's your age. But now you're thinking that's weird because before I said you could only take strings as an input. Well, to take an integer, for example, I need to put int and then brackets around our input. And whilst technically this input is still a string, what this int does is it converts it to an integer. So now this input is an integer and you can do a similar thing for floats, but instead of int, I'm going to need float. But the thing you need to be careful about is if I run this code and we'll just skip past this name part and I put my age as a string, you're going to get an error because this is supposed to be a float. Now, before we had our print statement, which printed hello world. And the nice thing about print statements is you could put any variable in the print statement and it would print it out. So if I print my name, it's going to print max. But if I wanted to print something else, like I want to print an age, then I'd put a comma and I'd put age. If I hit run, then I put to max 20. And the other thing is you could even declare something in the print statement. So if I put speech marks, max is, and then another comma, and then put years old, it would put max is 20 years old, which I am. I'm not a teenager anymore. Life sucks. Now, another really important data type is Booleans and Booleans can either be true or false. And you declare a Boolean by declaring something as I'm going to put max is cool. And to declare a Boolean, I'd put true with a capital T or I'd put false with a capital F. Now that we've covered the basic data types, let's talk about operators and operators let you perform operations on variables. Now, there are two main types of operators. We've got arithmetic operators and comparison operators. Now, computers are a lot like really, really complicated calculators. 
And because of that, in Python, we can also do a lot of complicated calculations. So with our numbers, we can do arithmetic operations. And you can do this with both floats or integers. So you could add them together. I could put print and I could put five plus five. And you guys know, I hope you know, that's 10. I could minus. And here's where it gets a bit weird. So if I put a star, this multiplies the numbers. Or if I put a dash, that divides the numbers. So now we know what arithmetic operators do. Do you think you can guess what comparison operators do? Well, if you think they compare things, you're correct. So we've got ones you probably expect. So I have smaller than. So if I put five smaller than six, if I print this, what I get is true. That's because all comparison operators evaluate to a Boolean. So five smaller than six is true. We've also got bigger than, and this is gonna evaluate to false, but we've also got smaller than equal to. So this would be smaller than equal to six. So I could put six here, and this would be true. I could also put bigger than equal to, this would also be true. And then I could make this smaller, that would be true. I could make this seven, and now it's false. But the other thing we have is, does six equal seven? And to do this, I'd put equals equals. So what we're asking here is, does six equal seven? And in this case, it's false. But if I put an exclamation mark and then equals, this means does not equal. And this is true. Now, the other neat thing you can do here is you can combine operators. So if I put brackets around this, and I put and, if I put six smaller than seven, both of these statements have to be true to evaluate to true. So we have six does not equal seven, which is true, and six smaller than seven, which is also true, so we have true. But if I change this, and I put bigger than, it's gonna evaluate to false. But instead of and, if I used or, that means this condition or this condition could be true. And one of these is true, so it'll evaluate to true. But let's say both of them are false and it evaluates to false. Well, then I could put another brackets around it and I could put a double negative and put not. So if this is false, not will evaluate it to true. You still with me? Is it very confusing yet? Hopefully not. <laughs> not. <laughs> so we've got these operators now that could either be true or false, but we probably want something to happen if six is equal to seven or if it's not equal to seven. And this is where conditionals come into play. If you imagine conditionals are kind of like forks in the road. You have to choose a path, but these paths are chosen depending on a condition. This condition would be at the fork of the road. So if we create a new conditional, let's say six equals six, this is true. But if we replace our print and we put an if statement here, and then we put a colon, we can print six equals six. So what's happening here is we're saying if six equals six, then do this, which is what's indented here. If I run that, then it prints that. The other thing I could do is if this ends up not being true, so I've changed it to if six does not equal six, then I could put else if six is smaller than seven, then I could put print six is smaller than seven. So this is false, so it would skip to the else if, which will print six is smaller than seven. There we go. But let's say this isn't true either. Then the last statement we could use is else. And what else does is it catches anything that doesn't go through the if that's not true, the elif that's also not true, or the many more elifs, then else would print no statements are true. There we go. So just to summarize everything, let's write a little if statement. So I'm gonna put an age and I'm gonna take an input here. What's your age? And remember, we need to convert this to an integer because ages are whole numbers. I mean, you could make it a float, you could make it decimal age, but eh, I don't know. And then I'm gonna put if the age is smaller than five, print, you're very young. LF, the age is bigger than 19, print, you're no longer a teen, and else, print you're old now do you see anything that this doesn't account for well between the ages of 5 and 19 if you put something it's gonna say you're old which you're not so we could put something else here saying 
age is bigger than or equal to 5 and age is smaller than or equal to 19. And then we can print, you're in the middle. All right, let's try it. So I'm going to put 4 and it says, you're very young. Or I could put 20, you're no longer a teen. But if I put 60, it still says you're no longer a teen. So the other thing we have here is this elif statement actually catches everything outside the range. This else statement is basically useless. So you really need to think about the edge cases and what you're doing when you're programming these kinds of statements. For example, if I put a negative number, it's still going to say you're very young. You really need to think about these things. So now that we've talked about conditionals, another neat thing we have is loops. Now loops let you repeat things a certain number of times. And we have two main types of loops. The first loop we have is for when you know the exact number of times you want to repeat something. And this is called a for loop. So to declare a for loop, I'm going to put for i in range. And as an example, I'm going to put five. So intuitively, if you look at this, we have a five, which means it's going to repeat five times. But we also have an I here. So what you should do is treat the I like a counter. So this counts which loop we're on. More technically, what iteration we're on. So in our for loop, I'm going to print out the value I. And we're going to see what it does. That looks kind of weird. It counted 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And yet, that is five numbers. But it, it is weird that it started with zero. And there is a reason for this. So computers are made up of a lot of switches. And as we know, switches are either on or off, zero or one. And since we've only got two values at the very fundamental value, it would be a complete waste if we didn't start from zero, right? And that's why we start from zero. But if we didn't want to start from zero, I could put a range of one to six. And if you see, it counts from one to five. The other weird thing is that I put six instead of five. Well, I want you to listen closely. So we've got a range of one till six. It's not to six, it's not past six, it's till six. And this means that we'll never reach six, we'll stop on five. Does that make sense? Now, sometimes we might not always want to go all the way to five. Sometimes we might want to skip a certain iteration, which means a loop, or just stop the loop entirely. So let's say we wanted to skip the number three. Well, firstly, I need a condition that asks the program, does i equal 3? So I'm going to put if i is equal to 3, then I'll put a continue. And what a continue does is it skips the next iteration of the loop. So if I print this, it counts 1, 2, and then 4, 5. But what if instead, after the second iteration, I wanted to just quit the loop entirely? Then instead, I could just put a break. And then it'll just count one, two. And both of these continue and break will work on our other loop, which I'm about to tell you about too. Now the other loop I'm about to talk about is a bit more tricky because we write them when we don't exactly know how many times we want our loop to happen. And this means our loop could be infinite. So this loop is called a while loop. So if I put while true, print hello, and I run this, this is an infinite loop. This will happen forever because this true will never be false. Now, if we replace this true with a condition, so if we create a, I'm going to stop this quickly. So if we create a Boolean, let's put weather hot and that is set to true. So instead we replace this with while weather hot. So whilst the weather is hot and weather hot is true, print hello. So to check if the weather is still hot, we'll need to take an input. So we'll put temperature equals input, what's the temperature? And remember, we need to convert this to, well, this could be a float this time. Now I'd say above 20 is hot, maybe? So I'll put if temperature is bigger than 20, then the weather is still hot. So we'll leave weather hot as true. But if it's anything else, then we'll set weather hot as false. So what's happening here is if the temperature is above 20, then it'll print hello and it will go again. But if it's anything other than bigger than 20, it'll set weather is hot and the loop will break. So let's try it. So what's the weather? I could put 10 and it's only done it once. But if I put 25, it'll ask again and again and again and again. And it might get a bit annoying, put 19 and it stopped. 
Now, do you remember the continue and break statements I had before? We can still use those here. Instead of declaring this as true, I could put continue. And instead of this, I could put break. Let's see if that works the same. So 23. But you'll notice that if we use a continue, it never reaches this print hello. And it says here, this code is unreachable, which is another reason we love PyCharm. Because if we continue here, remember it loops all the way back to the top of the while loop. So this isn't quite right. So because we're using different commands, we'll have to move this up here and then it will reach it. I can put 23 and I'll say hello and then it'll go back. Now you've always got a lot of different options in programming. So for example, I changed the weather hot in the first example and now I've used a continue and break. And this means you've always got to stay on your toes because there's always different things or different ways to improve your code. But yeah, that's everything you need to know about loops. So, so far we've covered variables, conditions, and loops. So we've covered a lot of the fundamentals now. So let's try and combine everything into a fun guess the number game. So in this game, we'll be picking a random number and the player has to guess what it is. Now, if they guess higher, we'll use a conditional to point them in the right direction. And if they guess too low, then we'll use another conditional to point them in the other direction. And we'll use a certain type of loop to keep asking them. And as a clue, we don't know how many times we want this loop to go for. So right now I'd suggest pausing the video and giving it a go. But if not, you guys can see how I would write it. So firstly, let's create a new script. I'm gonna call it guess the number game. And I'm gonna set our secret number. Let's set it to 23. And then we need to set a Boolean because we want to use a while loop because we don't know how many times this loop is going to run. So I'm gonna put correct guess equals false. And I've declared this because they haven't guessed correctly yet. So I'm going to put while not correct guess. So this means whilst the guest is not correct, then we're going to put guess equals. And remember, we need to convert our input to an integer. So I'm going to put integer and then input guess a number. Now, as I said before, if the guess is too high, then we want to point them in the right direction. So let's put if guess is bigger than secret number, then print too high and then we need to go the other way so else if the guess is below the secret number then print too low so as you can see we've considered it if the guess is higher than number and we've considered it if the guess is lower than the number which means the guess must be on the number if we reach the else statement so then we'll print you guess the number and then we can break the loop so let's try it so i'm going to run it going to guess 30 too high and then 19 too low and if I guess 23 you guess the number now if you don't like the spacing here you can just put a space and it will space it for you nice so you guys did super well you've learned a lot about the fundamentals of Python if you guys enjoyed this video and want to see a part two comment down below and if not Stay safe, and I hope to see you next time. See ya!